This episode of Metatrex is brought to you by Enterprise in Space. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter. Visit enterpriseinspace.org for more information. And if you'd like to help us keep Star Trek discussion coming to you each day, consider becoming a patron of the network through Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. Hi, I'm Monuente Reme. I played Echeb on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Metatrex on Trek FM. There's no greater challenge than the study of philosophy. My philosophy is that there is room for all philosophies on this station. Welcome, everyone, to episode 58 of Metatrex, Trek FM's show on Star Trek and philosophy. My name is Mike Morrison, and with me, as he always is, is Zachary Fruling. Today, we're going to be talking about dimensions in the Star Trek universe. And Zachary, we have a special guest today. But before we get to that, I noticed you're looking a little flat. If you think I look two dimensional now, wait till Bichet joins us. <laughs> Well, we should waste no time, and I just received a hail, so he is ready to come aboard the starship of Theseus. So we are going to go ahead and beam aboard our Patreon manager and host of Melodic Treks, Brandon Shea Mutala. Transporter Chief, energize. B. Shea, welcome to the starship of Theseus. How are you today, sir? Well... Good, I guess, but I got to say the communications device was left open and I, I heard Zach's comment there about how he looks two-dimensional, but just wait until I get in. Was that a fat joke? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's all of this podcasting. I seem to be growing in dimensions all the time. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. How are you guys doing? <laughs> We're doing great today. <laughs> doing well. We are looking forward to the discussion today. We had reached out to you a few weeks ago about having you on, and one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you aboard the Starship Theseus is to talk about Patreon, for which you are Trek FM's Patreon manager, and we ask you what topic you wanted to talk about in the main part of the program, and you pitched a really interesting subject at us. We're going to dig into dimensions today. But before we do, as I mentioned, you are a Patreon manager at Trek FM, and Zachary and I both uh, came to Trek FM through the Patreon program, and we thought it'd be a great time just to remind our listeners about Patreon, what it's about, and how they can get involved and be involved in the network. Yeah, so I got involved as well through through Patreon, and it was, I guess, oh, about a year and a half ago now. It was about July of 2015 when I first discovered the network, and within about a month, I was donating at the $25 a month level because I heard about the the perk of the roundtable option, and I'm like, for 25 bucks a month, I can go talk to people about Star Trek? I'm in. So uh, ever since then, I've been donating at that level. I'm the associate producer of Literary Treks, which is the show that I discovered, which brought me into the network. And uh, and yeah, so I've just, I've been getting involved with the network. I started my show, Melodic Treks, and now I'm on Warp 5, and I, I wanted to try and help out a little bit more. And for me, the biggest perk that, that got me interested in Trek FM was the Patrons Roundtable. So I really wanted to make sure that that we picked up the slack on that one there. Like we had, we had a couple episodes recorded. We were having difficulties getting them edited and released because it does take time to go through them all. And, uh, you know, Chris had been sick, uh, with his eye surgeries and whatnot over the summer last year. But, uh, I just kind of, I kind of stuck to it. We got a bunch of round tables recorded and produced and edited and released. And, and now we're on a solid schedule of having at least one a month for you. Uh, we ended up having two in January, which is really cool. And they vary in topic. We, we've done a commentary on the man trap. Uh, we did Trek trivia for our last mm-hmm. one, which is very cool. And, uh, as the Trek trivia, we actually had a prize of getting, uh, the winner on to talk about their favorite Star Trek episodes and we ended up having a tie so two people ended up coming on for so that's available in Patron Zone which is another great perk that we have um, 
So at the $5 a month level, if you donate to Patreon, you can get access to Patron Zone, which is where we have early releases and exclusive content, which are can range anywhere from just deleted outtakes from an episode that we might throw on there to, uh, you know, Ken Tripp and I have done a commentary for an episode of D-Space 9, and Amy and I did a commentary for an animated series episode, and... Um, the guys at Earl Grey did a nice bonus feature where they kind of ranked what they thought was better, Star Trek or Star Wars movies. That was pretty darn funny, if I say so. Um, but yeah, so it's really, really cool stuff on there. And and uh, a lot of shows are getting up with early releases now as well. And you can get them exclusively through Patron.Zone. Yeah, we've definitely had a dramatic increase in the number of early releases and exclusive content in the last uh, few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Earl Grey uh, is just about every week they get one. Uh, Metatrex and To the Journey as well. Um, you know, with me editing my Melodic Treks, I can't get Melodic Treks every time, but uh, Warp 5 I'm getting up there early as well. Uh, and there's been a few others in there as well. So it's it, it's really good. It's really growing. We're really trying to make sure that we can get you guys some really cool exclusive content and really cool early releases uh, to say thank you for uh, helping to support Trek FM, because honestly, we can't do it without you, the listeners. We should mention, Bichet, for uh, folks that may be listening for the first time or are unfamiliar with Trek FM, we are a 100% listener-supported network of Star Trek podcasts. I say Star Trek, but we have the 602 Club, where we talk about all things geekery out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think they call it the uh, Geekery Speakeasy. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we're covering every corner of the Star Trek universe and going beyond that with 602 Club. We've got uh, literary treks. We've got melodic treks. We talk about the books. We talk about uh, music. We're uh, Stage Nine is another podcast where we're looking at other projects that folks who have been involved in Star Trek through the years are working on other things and doing other things. And we highlight and feature that. We have, of course, uh, programs dedicated to all of the live action series as well as the animated series. Aaron Harvey, uh, the host of uh, Saturday Morning Treks, which is dedicated to the animated series, is also our art director here at Trek FM. And all of that is 100% free content that is available to be downloaded through the iTunes store or wherever people get their podcasts. And we don't ask for any type of membership. There's no subscription that you have to buy. It's all 100% free and supported by listeners just like you who give at various levels. And as you mentioned, Bichet, we've got a lot of uh, perks out there available at different levels of sponsorship through uh, Patreon. You mentioned you know, the $5 level and access to Patron Zone. Uh, the uh, guest spots with uh, the patrons roundtable. Zachary and I were actually on a couple of the very first patron roundtables. That's where he and I uh, met for the first time. And that's where this idea for Metatrex came from. And I was looking the other day, Zachary, and it's not a promise. We're not saying that, uh, you know, if you give it the $25 level and you're, you're involved in the patrons roundtable that you'll automatically one day host your own podcast. But I noticed that that first couple of rounds of... Uh, patrons roundtables. All of those folks are involved in Trek FM at, in one capacity or another on one of our many podcasts. This might go in the category of under-promising and over-delivering, but if memory <laughs> serves, all of us were in that first class of patrons roundtable yes. uh, participants, and here we are on Trek FM ourselves at this point. And it's actually dropped down to $15 a month for the roundtable, uh, and then 25 for the associate producer yes. credit. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, because we really want to get that involved. Because honestly, that's a really great perk. And that was that was really what got me interested. I'm like, yeah, I want to get on this podcasting thing and talk Trek. Yeah. And the great thing about the associate producer uh, credit that I should mention, and we're we're very fortunate, we're blessed here at Metatrex to have four associate producers. We mention them always at the what? end of the show. Yes, That's a lot. Yes. Isn't, that, uh, isn't that awesome? <laughs> we always mention these guys at the end of the show. We always give them a shout out at the very end of the program. And today, I'm going to go ahead and give them an extra shout out here at the beginning. Uh, Patrick Devlin, 
uh, Kay Shaw, who is also Zachary's co-host over on To The Journey. Of course, our good friend Norman Lau. Everybody knows Norman around the uh, around the network. And then Kit Lofstadt is actually our newest uh, associate producer here at Metatrex. And the great thing about that is these associate producers can get involved as much as they want to, as little as they want to. They can, you know, they, they can give their, give their monthly donation to the network and get the shout out every month. I know uh, Kay has been over here on our program. I know as an associate producer of Warp 5, you guys have had me on uh, over there on the NX01 um, several times. So it's, it's, it's great to have the opportunity to, not just not just give my donation, but uh, you know to also have an opportunity to be involved in, in the network and and have an opportunity to talk Trek either on Patrons Roundtable or many of the hosts reach out to their associate producers and ask for show ideas. Uh, I know that's been a common thing that hosts have done. I know for a fact that Patrick Devlin, our associate producer, is looking for a topic to join us on Metatrex. But I was going to say, I'm really amazed at the at the relationships that have been formed. Not a day goes by, almost, that I don't talk with Patrick about something and Kay about something. So we've mm-hmm. become, you know, genuine, lifelong friends. Mm-hmm. And Patrick, actually, it's not released yet as the time of this recording, probably by the time of this release either, but Patrick actually came on for a Warp 5 episode that's going to be dropping in early March. Uh, we did the first episode of our Season 3 retrospective, and he did a very good job. It was a lot of fun, so uh, he took to it. He was quite interested. He's like, what do I got to do? What kind of mic do I need? And what kind of programs do I need? And so I was helping him with that to try and find out what kind of uh, product he needed, and uh, he was took to it like a fish to water. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, over the, you know, over the course of time, I know I have been able to get small things like, um, for instance, wallpapers and things of that nature as well. Mm-hmm. So lots of perks out there for uh, patrons. And again, Trek FM is 100 percent listener supported. And we want to say to our associate producers who give uh, here and we recognize on Metatrex, but also to everyone, whether you give a dollar a month or whether you give a hundred dollars a month, we just want to say thanks because Star Trek talk is as popular now as it's ever been. And I have personally had conversations with people who feel that what we're doing on Trek FM benefits them. It adds something to their life. Uh, I know I have talked to multiple people who, you know, just talking about an optimistic future and, you know, digging in and talking about various uh, various episodes of Star Trek. It's it's given them a sense of personal joy. And so, you know, we're doing great things out there and we're building a community of Star Trek fans and it's it's just great the camaraderie and the fun that we have as we interact on the Babel conference. I just I just want to say thank you to all of the patrons out there across the network who give to Trek FM to make this possible. I should say, Mike, that you should be a little careful with those illustrated avatars we have as perks in the in the patron zone. They make you look even more two dimensional than usual. <laughs> so yeah, just visit patreon.com slash Trek FM and and sign up. Anything you can give is appreciated, right? You don't have to keep the same dollar a month uh, dollar amount each month. You know, if you if you can afford more this month and less next month, that's fine, and we understand, right? You know, times are tough right now for everybody, but anything mm-hmm. you can do to support us is great. And if you can't right now, you know, that's fine as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and we appreciate uh, you, Bichet, for stepping up and managing uh, Patreon for the network. I know you do a ton for the network. Uh, I know with, uh, your responsibilities with Patreon and then, uh, melodic treks, as you mentioned, warp five, where your co-host over there with Floyd Dorsey, uh, you've got, you've got a ton on your plate, man. Uh, I got room. Good thing. I'm so fat. <laughs> got lots of room on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm a heavy guy. I, I'm, I'm trying to work on my weight loss here. So, but, uh, I, I, I'm, I don't have trouble calling myself a big man. I'm with you, brother. The struggle is real. <laughs> I, I got to say, podcasting is not great for the waistline. <laughs> Star Trek in general, it's sedentary. You know, you sit, you watch TV, and then we sit and we talk about we, it. So, sounds like we need more away missions on Trek FM. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, at patreon.com, you know, if you start donating at the $3,000 a month level, that'll help us all get to Vegas, where we can have an away mission. 
Yes, without a doubt. That would be that would be outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> but again, we appreciate uh, our donors at all levels, and we appreciate our listeners. Uh, those of you who listen and, and you say, well, you know, I'm not able right now to give. We, we appreciate you downloading. And, you know, if you're, if you're listening to Metatrex and you're enjoying what we're doing, we, we invite you to go over to iTunes and, and leave us a rating, uh, leave us a review. Uh, that helps us out tremendously. So thank you for everything that you all do to make Metatrex and Trek FM what it is. So we mentioned at the top of the show that our topic du jour is dimensions. And Bichet, that was a choice of yours. Can you uh, say uh, just a little bit about why you wanted to talk about dimensions with us today? Well, I thought it was an interesting idea and an interesting topic. And I don't really want to talk about parallel dimensions themselves. What I mean by dimensions is, you know, like you and I were three-dimensional beings, length, width, height, right? But there's how many dimensions are there? You know, what would it be like if we came across a two-dimensional or a four-dimensional being? And, uh, and what kind of implications would that have upon us? And then what kind of examples would there be in Star Trek of uh, different dimensional beings? And uh, there's actually an interesting video. I wish I can't remember the name of the the year off of it right now, but uh, it's just called uh, it's just called the Fourth Dimension, and it's this old French film that I shared with you guys by a director named Jean Painlev. Yeah, 1936. Thank you. And I actually got it from the Criterion Collection. There's a collection of three discs called I think it's called Science is Fiction: 23 Films by Jean Painlev and there's some neat videos in there. There's like videos of seahorses and, you know, different things. Like he just, he does these science videos, right? But one of them is called the fourth dimension. And he goes through at the beginning and he starts talking about all these different dimensions and what each dimension is. Uh, but he expands upon it and he says, what would happen if a, this dimensional being encountered this dimensional being? What would they see? How could they have an impact on on other dimensions, and it really sparked something in my mind, and I thought it was a very fascinating idea. And my immediate thought was, of course, the loss when we have this two-dimensional being uh, from season four of the Next Generation that's pushing the ship along. and And it made me think: would would a two-dimensional being have that kind of force upon a three-dimensional object? So I just I proposed the idea to you guys and said, let's talk about this and let's see what we can come up with. Yeah, I think right off the bat, that's an important dis distinction to make between alternate dimensions or alternate universes versus mm -hmm. dimension in some sort of uh, physics, mathematical sense. And uh, I had never seen this video you were referring to, and you, you really should check it out, listeners, if, if you get a chance to. Um, it's only like 10 minutes long as well. It's a very short video. One of my favorite uh, reads is uh, Flatland by Edwin K. Abbott. And, and watching that video was like seeing... Uh, Edwin Abbott's account of, of these different multidimensional beings, one-dimensional beings and two-dimensional beings and three-dimensional beings kind of pop pop off the page visually. Of course, with, with Ed, Edwin Abbott's Flatland, it was like this um, it was like a geometry lesson, but it was also like Victorian era social commentary. On, you know, he made the the rulers be one, you know, one dimensional points that didn't understand the three dimensional beings, and it was you mm -hmm. know a lot of social commentary. But this idea of different dimensional beings encountering each other and what they would perceive—it's really hard for us, uh, you know, we three dimensional beings to visualize what encountering a higher dimensional being would be like. So it's useful as an intellectual exercise to kind of dial it back a little bit and start talking about lower dimensions that we do understand. What, what would it mean for a point to encounter a line? What would it mean for a line to encounter a three-dimensional object? And, and from then, by extension, we can start talking about what it would be like to talk for, for we three-dimensional beings to encounter a fourth or higher level dimensional being. Yeah, and perspective uh, plays into that scenario as well. For instance, you know, in, in encountering a uh, line, for instance, if you're if you're a point and you encounter a line, is it going to look like a line or is your perspective uh, going to be one that you you only perceive a point? You don't even perceive the, you know, the, the line as its own unique uh, dimension. So it's it's really fascinating. And of course, then you can throw in the concept of time itself as a dimension, much like the uh, prophets or the wormhole aliens from Deep Space Nine living outside of time so that they didn't even understand the concept of, of linear time. It had to be explained to them because they live outside of it. So there's there's a lot of interesting dimensions to talk about when we are discussing dimensions. Well, the relationship between between lower level beings or lower, lower level planes of perception is pretty interesting. So from the perspective of a point, the point presumably can't perceive an entire line because it only has has 
well, in this case, no dimensions, right? A point has no dimension at all. But it, so, you know, if a point encounters a line, it'll just encounter one point at a time. It can't perceive this extra exactly. dimension of, of length that a, that a line has. By extension, if you take a, a one-dimensional being and ask what can it perceive, well, what happens when a one-dimensional being encounters a two-dimensional object, a plane of some shape? Well, it's not going to encounter the entire plane. It's going to encounter sort of portions of it, an edge or a corner or something like that. And that's in its entire perceptual field. Kind of by extension, what happens when a two-dimensional being like a plane, you know, say a circle or a square or some some two-dimensional shape encounters a three-dimensional object? We do get to see this in in the Next Generation episode, The Loss. Presumably, the the, the plane-shaped uh, being doesn't have any um, uh, a sense of height, you know, the third dimension. So mm-hmm. it, it only perceives a slice uh, at a time. Uh, of some three-dimensional object. So I think the, the general principle involved is that from uh, the perspective of a lower level being, it only perceives a portion, like a, a dimensional slice of a higher dimensional being. And you can kind of see that as you work up, you know, from lower level to higher level dimensions. See, the the interesting thing about this video and the interesting part of this discussion for me is how difficult it is for us as three-dimensional beings to try and grasp the concept of, of a being that's even one dimensional difference from us. So what what I mean by that is when most people, like you go to a science class or whatever, and they try and explain what two dimensions are. They show you a piece of paper. Okay. Now a piece of paper is actually still a three dimensional object. There is height there. It's, yes. it's very, very, very small, it's but nominal. they use mm-hmm. that as a, as an illustration of what a two dimensional object would be. Now, like so we can't it, it's hard to grasp that there could possibly be a two dimensional being whatsoever a genuinely two dimensional being with no third dimension at all yeah yeah with none whatsoever and it's hard and so when they talk about the fourth dimension i don't know if i'm going to get ahead of us too much here but so they the in this video that i watched the the fourth dimension is time and if they described being able to see the fourth dimension for example if you looked at a person and saw the entirety of the fourth dimension, you would see them as an, like basically an infant, and you would see them, let's just say, as an old man. They lived till old age and died. You would see all of that basically, and how they they showed it in the video was like a line, you know, like that blurred from one end to the other with the baby at the left and the old man at the right. And because we can only perceive our third dimension, we can only see a slice of that fourth dimension at one time. Yeah. And the slice of that dimension is what we are. Time slices. Yeah, time slices, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's one theory of time, that time is just a, a continuum that's spread out and really fixed, that there's no really movement in time. What is moving is the is the present moment, a long time. But, you know, like, like all times when a philosopher doesn't understand what they're talking about, it's useful to make distinctions. So I think it's important to make a distinction between uh, an extra spatial dimension, what it would mean to have a fourth spatial dimension, and time as a fourth dimension. Those aren't quite the same things, and it's very easy to conflate the two. I wonder what a fourth spatial dimension would be. Well, and this is something that's postulated in, in modern theoretical physics, like superstring theory posits extra spatial dimensions that are very small or curled up to the point where they're they're imperceptible. I like to think of, say, uh, a being in Star Trek like, like Q from the Q continuum being able to pop in and out of our third dimension as some sort of spatial dimension that there's some sort of X, just like, just like a plane can't perceive, you know, the higher dimensions of, of, of height. Um, if you think of a, of an extra spatial dimension, a being being able to pop in and out of our third dimension from that fourth spatial dimension, that's not quite the same thing as time progressing. Okay. Yeah, and they use that, they did a very good example in the videos as well. So, so what they did is for us as a three-dimensional being to look at a two-dimensional being. So what they had drawn was basically a, a, a maze on the ground and they had a two-dimensional rat like walking around. So everything was flat. But because we're three-dimensional, we could come in and we could like put our finger into that two-dimensional thing and it would appear to that rat like that finger just came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. because yeah. he can't perceive a third dimension, right? So for us, we're just putting our finger down on a piece of paper or whatever, but it's this 
two-dimensional thing. So Q could be like that fourth dimensional being, and he he looks like he's just popping in and out of us, but to him, he's just putting his finger on our piece of paper dimension, right? Yeah, he walks through walls or pops out of thin air, exactly. makes makes things magically appear. And, you know, again, from the perspective of a plane, if like a three-dimensional object intersects the plane, it would look like this object is appearing literally out of nowhere because the, you know, previously if the, if the three-dimensional object was like above the plane and then started to intersect the plane, that that would from the, from the perspective of the two dimensional plane, it would just kind of pop into existence, and it seems to me that's what's happening with happening with uh, say Q from the Q continuum. Yeah, and I think it's very similar to what we see in Enterprise with the trans dimensional beings having the ability living in their own dimension of space and having the ability, uh, at least on a, li- on a limited basis, in entering our dimension. You, for instance, we see them able to interrupt the warp core of the NX-01, but they literally just stick their hands down in the warp core, and it's like they're stirring something up, and, and they're, they're wreaking havoc. They're walking through walls, so you know they have that ability to interact, to move uh, from their dimension into our dimension and how that worked at least in the context of Enterprise, always fascinated me. It might actually explain something of Q's supposed omniscience, right? You know, imagine a three-dimensional object being pulled out of a uh, out of a two-dimensional plane. The three-dimensional object would still perceive the two-dimensional plane, but not but not vice versa. So Q presumably would be able to look at our entire three-dimensional universe as a whole because he stepped outside of our three-dimensional universe, but presumably could still perceive it, just like a three-dimensional object would still perceive the two-dimensional plane, but not vice versa. Right. Mm. So Mike mentioned in the turbo lift here before we got to the bridge, um, the being in Darmok, right? So this being yeah. could flash into existence and then it would disappear and then it would appear somewhere else. Like that being could also be coming in and out of our dimension, our third dimension. It could be a fourth dimensional being or even a fifth dimensional are, being. Or are you saying it's a fourth dimensional chess game? <laughs> Ooh, that would be fun. <laughs> that sounds hard. I've barely mastered two-dimensional chess. Slow down. It's all it's always a chess game with Q and that being from Darmok. At Tanagra. <laughs> You're saying it was a ch- chess game at Tanagra? I'm there, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that that creature fascinated me because we didn't really get much of an explanation. It was certainly unique uh for the Star Trek universe. And and Bichet, when you first mentioned uh dimension, you know, my mind automatically went to Uh, the TNG episode, The Loss, that we've already mentioned. But outside of that, I really had to think about this in terms of Star Trek because it's not something that they've dealt with in-universe in in obvious ways. There are little nods here and there, certainly, you know, and we'll we'll talk about uh, the the distinction with the mirror universe and, and, and those because we don't want to conflate them. But Nevertheless, you know, there, there's just not obvious ways in which Star Trek has dealt with this. And so we have this creature in uh, Darmok that uh, we kind of forget about because, you know, the greater story was, you know, this kind of philosophy of language that they're dealing with in the episode and Captain Picard trying to find a way to communicate uh, with his counterpart. And so we gloss over uh, this creature, but it was a very unique creature in terms of Star Trek, as you mentioned, able to pop in and pop out and it pops in, it does damage. So it obviously has the ability to interact in our dimension, but certainly it is somewhere outside of, uh, you know, three dimensional space because, you know, it's there one minute, it's gone the next. And also, we can't even really see it properly. It's like this ghost image almost, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. this silver glowing thing, right? And that would make sense because if you think of what it's like to perceive from the perspective of a lower level dimension, you're not not able to see the entire higher dimension, right? You know, when a three-dimensional object slice, you know, intersects that two-dimensional plane, the two-dimensional plane can't perceive the entire three-dimensional object. So getting back to the loss, it seems like that field of two-dimensional objects wouldn't be able to perceive the entire... Uh, enterprise. Um, Likewise, kind of by extension, you know, we three-dimensional beings wouldn't be able to perceive an entire uh, four-dimensional being. So yeah, that that kind of weird uh, visual way of representing this this weird creature kind of popping in and out of our third dimension, it's incomplete. It's not coherent. It doesn't look like an entire being. And that's exactly what you would expect if you were genuinely perceiving a higher dimensional being, because we wouldn't perceive it in its entirety. 
So to me, it seems rather genius to think that they would uh, come up with this concept. I'm just almost disappointed that it wasn't revisited or somehow reexamined because I, I, I think it's rather unique. Yeah, but what's more important, revisiting this being or all these wonderful memes that we got from this episode? <laughs> Well, the meme the memes are great, but you know what <laughs> what occurs to me is that they were able to perceive the approach of this creature because, as memory serves, it emitted some type of EM signature, so three dimensional shadow, some type of yeah, some well, some type of certainly some type of shadow or some type of of uh, I think it was an EM signature that they that they referenced. So as I see it, as it moved in and out of our dimensional space, it emitted some type of, you know, some type of measurable, quantifiable uh, energy signature. And I think you would expect that. And again, I'm kind of a dunce when I talk about dimensions because like, like Biche mentioned, they're genuinely uh, difficult to understand, especially in terms of higher dimensions. So and I keep kind of dialing it back. What does it mean? What does this mean in two and three dimensions? You know, when the three dimensional object intersects a two dimensional plane, you would expect some sort of effect on the plane, right? There's an actual intersection there or the three dimensional object casts some sort of shadow on the two dimensional plane. It's not that it passes through unnoticed. It's that it, it causes some effect within that um, lower dimensional, I don't want to say a sphere, but a but lower dimensional realm. Hmm. But I, th I think that there's a challenge in talking about dimensions with Star Trek in general, partly because the term dimension is used in so many different ways. You know, uh, it's used in terms of alternate dimensions. We have this mathematical sense of dimension like we get in, in TNG, The Loss. And, and on top of that, uh, when, when this interesting dimensional stuff happens in Star Trek, it doesn't get a lot of attention. I think The Loss is the only episode that I can explicitly think of where we're, we're talking about dimensions in some sort of mathematical way along the lines of Flatland or along the lines of this video that Bichet mentioned. But I think the concept of dimensions can be useful in explaining certain phenomena that we see inside the Star Trek universe. I think, for example, um, you know, if we're trying to give some sort of, you know, quasi-realistic account of what warp drive would mean or subspace would mean, you can try to give some sort of dimensional explanation for those uh, wormholes, right? The fact that space can kind of yes. bend in on itself and there's a shortcut, you know, if our three-dimensional space can bend to the point where there's a shortcut between points in three-dimensional space, presumably that three-dimensional Dimensional space is bending into a fourth spatial dimension along the lines of what happens in general relativity theory, the presence of matter causing space time to bend and warp uh, gravity wells. You know, these, these concepts are, are um, throughout the Star Trek universe and, and the dimensional aspect doesn't get a lot of attention, but I think you can use this concept of mathematical or spatial dimensions to explain a whole realm of phenomena inside Star Trek. Certainly. It, it's easier to understand almost multi-dimensions as a being you know like like q or this darmok being or the prophets than it is to try and say a dimension another dimension would be the reason for warp travel or a wormhole because just the concept of trying to picture space actually bending like i, I can't yeah. even grasp that i can't well, wrap my mind around you can that. kind of again you can kind of dial it back to talk about two and three dimensions right suppose you had like a a bed sheet that was spread out taut like we were all standing around in a circle holding a bed sheet <laughs> and suppose someone threw a bowling ball in the middle of it that two-dimensional plane would warp right into a third right. third dimension and if you took like if you took a marble and you sort of fling you know flung it towards the uh towards the bowling ball in the middle but at an angle it would kind of orbit just like just like planets orbit a star and so these kinds of analogies these lower dimensional analogies can be useful in explaining what happens in higher dimensions. So if you have a, a lump of matter, something big and large like a star sitting out there in space-time, thinking of space-time as this kind of three-dimensional fabric, the star warps that three-dimensional space into a fourth dimension. So when you take another piece of matter, something planet-sized like the Earth or or this planet that Darmok and that Darmok took on took place on. If you kind of flung that towards the star, it would orbit in three dimensions, just like the marble orbits the bowling ball on the two dimensional plane. So again, we can't really visualize it, but we can we can understand it by analogy. So, so uh, this has got me thinking of something here now. It's my, we're going off script here now. Would this explain? That's what the we do theory. on Metatrix. <laughs> <Because, laughs> would this explain the theory of how? The closer you get to warp speed, light speed, the slower time goes? 
not directly because that's more a function of special relativity than yes. general relativity, but but general rel- relativity explains the the concept of space time as a well it unifies them it explains the concept of space time it doesn't doesn't really explain time dilation in some sort of narrow sense but it does explain why gravity seems to be something like action at a distance the fact that the, these objects can have an influence on each other even though there's literally nothing between them. Okay. Like is like it, again to dial it back and use the bowling ball and the marble analogy, the bedsheet analogy. You know, if you, it's not that the bowling ball is influencing the marble in any sort of you know mystical sense, right? There's no, there's no spooky action at a distance. It's that the space that they're inhabiting is being warped, and so it's causing this interaction yeah. to happen. But not because the two objects are influencing each other directly. It's that the space they're in is being modified. Okay. And I think, at least in theory, that is fairly close to the explanation, at least what little explanation we get of the warp drive concept. They're creating a bubble, so to speak, uh, making the enterprise, as it were, the bowling ball. Yeah, unfortunately, they, they don't really, they, they, they seem to talk about warp drive, warp drive in very inconsistent ways in Star Trek. So mm-hmm. it's hard to really kind of narrow this down in one way. One way of explaining warp drive is that warp drive, you know, literally warps or shortens the space that it, that it works by modifying the space around it. And so if you can imagine this, you know, a, a starship and it's got a warp drive and it is compressing the space in front of it, shortening the distance, then it would right. seem to go, you know, faster than light or at a faster than usual rate, but not because it's violating the of nature it's because it's warped space just like the presence of a gravity well warps the space around it that's one of the things visually that i loved about star trek beyond is actually for the first time we got a visual representation of what a warp bubble at least theoretically could look like and uh, i could you know sometimes on my blu-ray i'll just pause that uh, because i I i think it's fascinating and again you're basically making the enterprise you know that bowling ball that has the ability to warp space but oftentimes it gets explained almost like a hyperdrive uh you're moving really really fast well that's star wars that's that's what they do in star wars they have they have a drive that allows them to move really really fast they're not warping space they're just moving at hyper light speeds and i think sometimes we we have a tendency to to conflate the two concepts and that's i think that's probably as much star trek's fault in terms of production and their lack of meaningful conversation or explanation within the Star Trek universe of what warp drive is doing. It's so central to to Star Trek and yet, you know, they don't well, they don't spend a lot of time there's two things, right? There's there's explaining what we see on screen, and of course, on screen, um, Star Trek is not always consistent in how it talks about these types of phenomena. Of course, because all of these phenomena serve their storytelling devices, right? So what matters is the story in universe mm-hmm. more more than the actual mechanics. Star Trek does a pretty good job of keeping it all coherent, but not not entirely. What's fun from my point of view, I think, is the fact that we can explain these different kinds of phenomena like warp drive in terms of warping space in some sort of uh, multidimensional sense that could potentially open up fruitful means of inquiry for us. Like how do we get from there to here, right? Well, if we can try to f- figure out a way to warp the space around us, then maybe we can come up with a warp drive, <laughs> right? It's not, so, you know, explaining what we see on screen is interesting. It's fun. We're Star Trek fans, but if that opens up a fruitful line of inquiry for actual scientists who want to create an actual warp ship, then that's even more exciting for me. So this warp theory, so the warping dimensions and whatnot. So I, I could be going off on the wrong. I don't. I don't. It's a neat idea, but it's so hard to understand. So the Picard maneuver. Okay. So how would that explain the Picard maneuver by being in the two places at once? Because they use that as in in the episode they describe it as because he's going so much faster than the speed of light. You can see it in two different spots at one time, right? But to me, I cannot, I cannot grasp my it, head around. It's that. like it's like jet lag, but it's warp lag, warp lag. Because it, it would, it would, even if it's going, the, it's going faster than the speed of light. It's only going this fraction of a distance, right? Like I don't know, whatever it is, like ten kilometers or whatever it is. The the, the other one would still be gone, like immediately. 
Well, I, to use an analogy, and this is something you listeners at home can't see, but I see it. I see you kind of waving your hand around while you're talking here, uh, here while we're doing the podcast. And and actually, because of the video lag, I, it actually looks like your hands are in multiple places at once. There's kind of a ghost shadow of, of mm-hmm. the, the motion of your hands. I think of that as kind of what's going on, that... I think of it as some kind of perceptual lag, like the motion of the stargazer, because it's faster than the speed of light, creates this perceptual ghost image. So it's hard to actually know for sure where the ship is. Hmm. Yeah, I was laughing here in my podcast studio when you mentioned the Picard maneuver, because I'm thinking, what the heck does Picard tugging on his tunic have to do with dimensions? It, it happens so fast, you, you if you blink, you miss it. <laughs> he just does it multiple times. He's like... <laughs> <laughs> But I, Bisha, you you raise you raise a good point, and I think Zachary, you're exactly right. I think it's I think it's a perceptual lag that uh, allows for that phenomenon to happen. Hats off to Captain Picard for using that, but I, I don't think it really fits into this idea. I don't think he's moving between dimensions or or, or anything like that. He's just creating a, a perceptual shadow, knowing that you know human. Uh, visual perception has its limits. Well, I think a better example of of this multidimensional idea would be, say, a ship emerging from a wormhole, right? A ship emerging from a wormhole seems to pop into a a location in three-dimensional space, seemingly out of nowhere, because presumably the wormhole is a tunnel between, a fourth-dimensional tunnel between three-dimensional points in space. We kind of have an interesting concept with yesterday's Enterprise in which and and I I realize that we're dealing with time and I don't want to I don't want to conflate time and dimension but I think visually speaking we get kind of an interesting visual image of the enterprise C almost slice by slice slowly emerging into our space and I think I think that's very much what we're talking about here. And, and, and I love the visual representation because it's not like you see all of the Enterprise C at once. You see a portion of it as it emerges into our perceptional, our third, our three dimensional perceptual realm. Yes. Yes. Right. Very much like what would happen if a three dimensional sphere starts to intersect a two dimensional plane. You would see the, the two dimensional plane would perceive that three dimensional sphere as a circle that grows in shape. And then as it continues to progress through the two dimensional plane, it would shrink in shape until you, you know, the, the, the sphere leaves the perceptual realm of the, of the two dimensional plane. So similarly, as the Enterprise C emerges into three dimensional space, it grows into our perceptual, perceptual realm. And as, of course, as, as it leaves our three-dimensional uh, realm and in- re-enters the, the temporal rift, you kind of see the Enterprise C uh, leaving our perceptual realm, you know, sort of slice by slice, just like what would happen if a sphere intersects a plane. Bichet, in the video that you shared, I think the difference is that the Enterprise C is a three-dimensional object from a three-dimensional realm moving into another three-dimensional realm. Time just happens to be the the divider. Uh, in the video, they used the, the idea of an orange, uh, you know, a three-dimensional orange uh, entering into a two-dimensional space. And so it was very much what, what it set me in the mind of is if anyone has ever had a, a, a CT scan, uh, where you're literally taking pictures of the inside of the human body slice by slice. And so what we see is that orange moving through. So you go through the peel into the, you know, into the pulp. And as it moves through, you get the seed core and it continues to move through. And then you're to the other side of the pulp and then eventually back to the, you know, back to the peel. And so just slice by slice, piece by piece, that's what's perceived in the two dimensional world. And just yeah, just to make you understand. So you guys have one of those cheese graters that stands up, and how the one side has the three, so you'd cut three slices of cheese at once. So that's basically the cuts that you would see in an orange, right? So it, you you see a little bit, and then it opens up. And now now what I didn't grasp in the video, and what I don't believe I don't believe that two dimensional beings can exist, right? Myself because. I don't get again. It's because I understand three dimensions. Yeah, I mean like, they 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 exist in the same way that Platonic objects exist, right? They, they're they're abstract ideas that might exist in some sort of Platonic sense, but they don't exist here in our physical universe in our world. Yeah, because yeah. how could they interact? Like, so they use this example that 
if you saw an orange go through a two-dimensional, the two-dimensional being would see this. But I mean, if the two-dimensional being is here and this orange is coming through here, how could it still even perceive it? Because on this plane that it's going through, there's no height to that level. Yeah, it might perceive its edge, or it might, yeah. it might, might perceive its curvature of the, the you know, but the, there the curvature be an of, edge. Well, it, it might perceive the curvature of the circle. You know, as the as the three dimensional orange intersects a plane, it'll create a two dimensional curve in the plane of the two dimensional field. So curves are two dimensional things. Crazy. Yeah, and then that's also I don't know that four dimensional beings would exist either. But as I said in the turbo lift on the way up here, this video actually helps me to understand God and understand my Christian faith because I can barely grasp one dimension above me or below me, mm -hmm. a two-dimensional or a three -dim four-dimensional object. I can barely grasp that with my mind. I can kind of understand it, but I can barely. So somebody like God would be like an infinite dimensional being. I'm never going to understand that. Well, I think it, w it would... Exp Again, we don't want to veer into theology too much, but it would explain the omniscience and the omnipresence of God, right? It would explain the fact that God, or Q, I like to use Q as the example. I think Q is this, you know, deity-like creature that's omniperceptive and seems to have the omniscience. So Q is kind of a stand-in for God in this discussion, I think. But, you know, the fact that a higher dimensional being can, can perceive the entire lower dimension at once would explain a certain theological concepts like omniscience. Right. So I like, I don't know, it brings me great comfort. Like this video brought me a lot of, you know, a lot of thought, a lot of great ideas and a lot of comfort, believe it or not. One of the things you guys mentioned that that struck me is this idea of jumping between realms of the same dimensional level. So you mentioned, uh, you know, slices of cheese from a cheese grater. If you had three slices of cheese that, you know, stacked on top of each other, one above the other, if a, a two-dimensional being from one of those slices jumped into the other, another slice, it would be at the same dimensional level, right? It would still be two dimensions, but it's kind of moved from its own two-dimensional universe to an alternate two-dimensional universe. So that concept kind of, again, by extension and three dimensions might explain this concept of alternate universes inside Star Trek. If Captain Kirk as a three-dimensional being ends up in a mirror universe, then that mirror universe is three-dimensional, just like our universe. But, you know, what's happened is that three-dimensional being has been sucked out of its universe into another dimension, placed in another three-dimensional realm, an alternate universe. It's not a higher dimension, but it's an alternate three-dimensional universe. Wow. That is an excellent, excellent visual. <laughs> Yeah, and the thing that the the thing about that I think that's so confusing for people is that we refer to it as a mirror universe. So it's not really a mirror universe. The idea of a mirror universe and and Biche, I'm going to go back and use the example in your video. They had two dimensional mice. They were little flat mice crawling around in a in a box, basically. And they literally take one of those mice and they flip it over, okay. And the image uh, was fascinating. There were there were shadows of mice to illustrate two. There were shadows mice. of mice. It was a yes. very interesting visual. Yeah. So how yeah. they did it was they they clearly had a maze that had a glass bottom and a light shining from above, right? And then it shone down on the ground, and then they were filming that shadow on the ground, right? Yeah. So that's how they did it. Two dimensional mice. Yeah. Well, again, in yeah. 1936, I mean, re really, the concepts, the visual concepts in this video, I think are, if I can use the phrase light years, uh, beyond, I think what we would expect from a video, from a movie in 1936, they took uh, a man and they said, okay, so, you know, a two dimensional man, we flip him. And now his heart is on the opposite side, for instance, those were the examples that they gave. And so almost calling the mirror universe, the mirror universe is really conflating the concept. It's not a mirror universe at all. But this idea of being able to reverse a being into another dimension is fascinating. So again, you kind of have to slow down the reasoning to be able to visualize this. So suppose you have a two-dimensional being, you know, that inhabits this two-dimensional plane, and you lift that being up into the third dimension, flip it over, and plunk it back down in its two-dimensional realm, it would appear to be reversed. And the example they use in the video is a letter. Like suppose you took the letter G and you mm -hmm. pulled it off the page, flipped it, you know, inverted it, and plunked it back down, it would appear reversed. 
Now, again, use that as an analogy for our third dimension. Suppose you took a three-dimensional being, pulled it out of its third dimension into a higher dimension, reversed it, whatever that means to reverse a three-dimensional object. I don't think that's <laughs> obvious at all, but do your best to visualize that and, and plunk it back down inside of its three-dimensional universe certain features of that would be reversed. And I could imagine that meaning a few different things. It could, I could imagine it being literally like left to right reversal. So, you know, your heart's now on your right side and Commander Riker now right. swings his other leg over objects and things <laughs> things like that. I could also imagine it being some sort of inversion where like your your insides are now in, on your outside, some sort of weird, you know, inner outer reversal. I'm not sure what that would, that's even harder to visualize, I think. Um, but I, 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 saw, ima- I saw a movie about that. I think it was the Saw 7. <laughs> Where the insides were all on the outside. I, don't know. I didn't see. I didn't see that one. Horror I, movie. I, I, I don't know. Bad I'm more joke. of a I'm more of a rom com guy. You know. <laughs> bad joke. Well, if you have a right handed a right handed person, he now writes with his left, and he writes in reverse. He doesn't just merely write with his left hand, but perceptually, what you and I would see is backwards writing completely. But what's interesting is I think from the perception of that three-dimensional being that's been reversed, nothing has changed, right? It's not like the being has actually been reversed. It's that its position in three-dimensional space has been has been reversed. So I would perceive myself to still be writing with my right hand, but everyone else would perceive me as writing with my left hand. Think about that for a moment. <laughs> Mind is blown. His brain is gone. So... Zachary, I'm kind of thinking about Times Squared in which we get a Captain Picard from you know, six hours in the future. He's he's uh, pulled out of time. He's from another uh, slice of time. And so we don't understand him and he doesn't understand. It's almost like he's existing in a bubble. And he's only... A matter of fact, I think they... I think they kind of phrased it that what was going on around him in our perceptual universe were just shadows and images to him because he was basically uh, out of out of sync. If you will. Well, it's like it's like, you know, snatching a goldfish out of its bowl and plunking it down in another goldfish bowl. Right. There's the, presumably there's some disorientation there. And of course, it, it, that doesn't quite make sense to me in that episode because it's still the Enterprise and it's should be largely familiar to that Picard, I would think. So I'm not sure what what causes this perceptual weirdness in that episode, but it's it, it's still the Enterprise. I don't understand the confusion in that case. Well, in, in terms of talking about uh, time in terms of a dimension. Uh, I think that it seems to me like there would be some perceptual because in essence, if you're if you're defining time as another dimension, he is out of sync with his he's out of sync with his with his dimensional space, his his time, his again, if we're looking at time as being a fourth dimension, he's out of sync with that fourth dimension of I kind of understand. Of being. I, I'm picking up what you're laying down here. I kind of understand what you're saying. That's so because they they've picked him up and moved him somewhere else along his temporal existence, mm-hmm. right? It's it's disorienting, right? So he's not seeing everything properly. Like you know, it's it's strange for him because he's just moved. Something's out of sync for him. Yes, exactly, exactly. That that just came to mind when we were talking about that. But again, I don't I don't want to conflate time and dimension even though we consider time as a as a fourth dimension you mentioned earlier uh how the video was able be shaved for you to understand god and it causes me to reflect on the wormhole aliens the prophets from deep space nine in which they live outside of time and you know the the past and the present and the future are all the same to them because they exist they, outside of they, time they, they exist they are outside a fifth of dimensional being yeah, maybe they exist outside of time and so uh, as i was watching the video my thoughts went to the the prophets the wormhole aliens and really in in a lot of ways guys they are um a little less mischievous but you know there's some there's some real similarities between the prophets from Deep Space Nine and the Q Continuum, I think. But based on what you were saying, I would say that the Q Continuum would probably be like a fourth dimensional being, and 
then the prophets would be like a fifth dimensional being because for them they can't grasp time. Right. Because to them, they're just looking down at it and time is all below them, basically. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think this is a really useful way of understanding time as a fourth dimension. If you, if, if, you, if you look at things from the prophet's standpoint, they see this continuum of time just stretched out. I like to, again, I keep dialing it back because this is the only way I can understand it. So I, <laughs> I you know, sorry if I'm a dunce, guys, but this is what I have to do to make sense of this. So I imagine like, uh, like a, well, you know those old flip books, like little animation flip books where you yes, flip the pages and it, looks, and it looks like some motion is happening, some sort of animation, right? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. So imagine like, a, a two-dimensional stick figure drawn on one of these pages and you flip the pages and it looks like the two-dimensional stick figure is moving. You go, okay, great. From the from the perspective of looking, you know, if you kind of flip through these, these pages, one slice at a time or one page at a time, it looks like there's motion. But really that's an optical illusion, right? If you look at the, the book as a whole, there's no actual motion happening there. All you see is this Uh, slice after slice after slice of what looked like fixed points in time where there where no motion is happening. So if you imagine a three dimensional flip book, whatever that means, right? (laughs) Where, where each slice is a three dimensional space time realm, you know, an entire universe, a snapshot of an entire universe in three dimensions. And then the next moment in time is another snapshot of the entire universe in three dimensions. And you imagine this multi-dimensional continuum of three-dimensional slices into this fourth dimension of time. If you can perceive that entire continuum, it doesn't look like there's any motion there. So you can understand the prophet's confusion in trying to understand linear time and motion through time, because from their point of view, they don't see any motion. They don't see any change. They perceive the entire continuum at once of these three-dimensional time slices, um, just like we perceive the two-dimensional time slices in the flip book, but they don't see any actual motion. If they do perceive a motion, to them, it's an optical illusion. It's not real. So they have a hard time understanding our perception of time as a real uh, facet of our, of our experience. And Zachary, I should mention that we talked about paradoxes of motion in Metatrex episode 54 entitled the... The Nenebeck Paradox. Nenebeck Paradox. If memory serves. Yes. Yes. So, listeners, if you want to hear more about paradoxes of motion, go back to our back catalog. It's Metatrex episode 54. So, you know, I guess... My question for you guys is, this is the only way I can understand this stuff. I have to kind of reason about higher dimensions by analogies with lower dimensions. Are these analogies with lower dimensions, like the the flip book example, helpful in understanding why the prophets perceive... Um, you know, our three-dimensional existence and our temporal existence, our, our linear, linearly temporal existence as they do. Are these helpful analogies or do these, or do they leave something unexplained? It works for me. That makes absolute sense because you can easily grasp that. It's, it's hard to try and picture a flip book made of three-dimensional space-time, but you can, you can extrapolate and say, okay, I, I can grasp the flip book of the animation. Okay, so it's just one little bit for me to picture. This is, okay, I can kind of understand that, yeah. So basically what I'm seeing in my mind when you say that is, you know when uh, Seven of Nine is sitting there in, uh, in uh, Astrometrics? And she's got like a view of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. And it's like that, you know, so I'm basically I'm picturing a view of the galaxy and then next to it on another page is a view of the galaxy. And next to it on another page is that view of the galaxy. And like and the, the prophets yeah. are just going through and flipping through that with their thumb. Like <laughs> It might be relativity when uh, things start to go kind of haywire temporarily and everyone, I think maybe Chakotay's in Captain Janeway's ready room and, and he leaves kind of a, a trail behind him and like he appears to be in multiple places at once as, as he's... Because that's how I kind of picture it. Like, you know, there's, I'm over here, then I'm over here, then I'm over here. And it's like this three-dimensional ghost image almost. <laughs> um, or uh, I, I keep wanting to use analogies because I, I think they're fun and they're the only things I understand. But you know those uh, stretches of candy? Like they'll make these like, like a long tube of candy. And if you if you slice the candy, there's like a cool image inside, like a little star or a little design yeah. or a little watermelon or something. And they make these things in long tubes. And as you slice them, you get this two-dimensional um, scene, a two-dimensional picture inside this the, the, the long three-dimensional tube of candy. Imagine like a four-dimensional candy tube, and you slice one of those, and you get a three-dimensional universe out of that slice. And then you slice the next, you know, hit the next slice off the four-dimensional tube of candy, and you get a three-dimensional universe out of that. Yeah. I think I might have a good Star Trek example for you, is when uh, they go into the wormhole in Star Trek The Motion Picture, right? Mm-hmm. And... You know, so like where you could see on the screen, like a, a, 
uh, a special effect representation of a slice of multiple time, right? Where they're like slow down or whatever. Right? Yes, that is brilliant. And that is why the motion picture is more brilliant than people give it credit. For, yeah, that is, a, that is an incredibly brilliant visualization of being of leaving a three dimensional trail in a higher dimension in a higher dimension. Right. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a that's a great example, Boucher. Great example. Yay! <laughs> so there were a couple other things on our notes, Zachary, that I I, I want to kind of throw in there, um, and a couple of them I don't think really apply to our discussion. Um, one of the things that comes to mind: Species Eight Four Seven Two, talking about fluidic space. We're not really talking about a dimension here, are we? Well, I don't know. I mean, just like if you take a two-dimensional being and you plunk it out of a two-dimensional realm and plunk it in another two-dimensional realm, that two, that second two-dimensional realm could be very different. So, again, by analogy, if you take a three-dimensional... Like if it was marble cheese. It could be... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That two dimensional cheese slice, you know, one, one slice could be marble, the next slice, the next two dimensional slice above that and could be, uh, you know, could all be all cheddar, cheddar could be brie, you know, right. But, th- but those, those are very different textures, very different consistencies. They have different properties, even though they're still two dimensional slices. So again, kind of by analogy, you take our three dimensional Voyager ship, pull it out of ordin- what pull it out of our, our three dimensional universe, plunk it into another three dimensional realm, a different three dimensional slice, so to speak, that could have very different properties than our three-dimensional realm okay uh, yeah when you put it like that i can it's a it's a different slice of cheese yeah because you know in, in thinking through that i mean they were three-dimensional beings they obviously were able to exist uh here in our space and at least a... yeah I, I don't think of, of species 8472 as being a higher dimensional being i think of them as three-dimensional beings from a different three-dimensional realm than our three-dimensional realm Okay. Right. Okay. Right. So, and they have three legs, so they're three dimensional. <laughs> Absolutely. As opposed to Q, like Q would be an example of of a higher dimensional being that kind of pops in and out of existence, right? That's not what not what's going on with species eight four seven two. It seems it seems like their realm, fluidic space, is a different three dimensional space than ours, and it has different properties, made of different stuff, maybe who knows? But it's it still seems like they're three dimensional beings. They don't seem to have those weird uh, quasi mystical properties that higher dimensional beings like Q has. Yeah. See, that's another great visual. Like, you're very good at giving great visual representations there, Zach. Like, I always assumed that to get to fluidic space, like, you know, you know, in my backyard, if I dig deep enough, I'll get to water, right? So, like, that's kind of how I pictured fluidic space is you just dig deep enough in, in space and you're going to get to fluidic space, right? But obviously not quite. I don't know. That's just always so, how so I So you're saying at, at the core of our three-dimensional universe, if you could dig to its core, so the center, you get, you center of the universe, you hit fluidic space. I don't think it works that way. Yeah, I always, <laughs> always thought of it in terms of, you know, we, we have this, this silly thing that we do, you know, a panch check at the beginning of uh, our episodes to check our mic levels and, and, and whatnot. It's, it's a lot of fun that we have. Uh, before we actually start uh, recording and sometimes we'll collect some funny banter and and we'll put it out there at the beginning or end of, of an episode here on uh, Metatrex but yeah I, I, I've always thought of the divide between normal space what we call normal space and fluidic space literally the pants because there's a three-dimensional world on the outside of your pants there's certainly a three-dimensional world on the inside of your pants and your pants you know, are, are, are what's dividing those, those two, three dimensional, uh, existence. And thank goodness your pants separate, uh, the, the, the two, three dimensional worlds. I, but. I actually kind of love this idea that you could just like plunk, a uh, plunk, a, a, a mine or a well in the middle of space in the middle of nowhere and just turn on the mine. And it would produce water. <laughs> it's a fluidic space. Well, I don't know. Pump that thing. You could plunk it anywhere, right? It doesn't matter. If you just keep digging into space time enough, you're going to produce water. I just like thinking of Mike's pants as a trans-dimensional barrier. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to get us back on track. <laughs> That's so, ridiculous. <laughs> so we we've, we've mentioned we've mentioned like fourth and fifth dimension uh uh beings. And so I don't think we can have this conversation without visiting Bride of Chaotica from uh, Star Trek Voyager. The in fifth which we, dimension. The fifth dimension <laughs> that evidently were photonic beings of some sort. 
Well, there's a reason that they 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 call it the fifth dimension because at that point, especially in the 1950s mm-hmm. and 60s, it was pretty well understood that we could conceive of time as being a fourth dimension. So if we wanted to talk about yet another spatial dimension, it couldn't be the fourth dimension because people are already talking about time as being the fourth dimension. So the fifth dimension referred to another spatial dimension besides the three that we're familiar with and besides time as a fourth dimension. Yes, yes. Now, now obviously, the the... Alien entities that we encounter in Bride of Chaotica certainly were not from uh, the fifth dimension, as um, as they you know, as the holodeck spoiler, characters. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! As the uh, holodeck characters, but rather they were they were some type of photonic being. So you know it's important that we make that make that distinction. But I, I don't think we can have this conversation without w- without bringing that up and and making that distinction. I didn't like that episode. Really? I'm not a fan of Brian of Chaotica. Oh, I love it. I think it's so much fun. Deadlock. That's where it's at. But I, did, I didn't luck. like Times Squared, so, you know. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we can learn anything from Bride of Chaotica in particular about higher dimensions, except, except again, because it's useful to distinguish the fourth dimension as, as a temporal dimension from the fifth dimension as a spatial dimension. But in, in general, I think this, this is important. If you're, if you're listening to this episode and you haven't been thinking about dimensions before, if you're not familiar with theoretical physics, if you're not familiar with, with, with these ideas other than what you see on screen in Star Trek, you know, they're great and in, interesting intellectual exercises. What, what would it mean to encounter a four dimensional being? But it's worth noting that part of at least one theory of theoretical physics, super string theory, posits higher dimensions as a way of making the math come out right. So it, it's not um, it's not outside the realm of actual possibility to say, you know, there, there may be higher dimensions that we're not aware of. I think it's important to note that, you know, as, as much as we're talking about higher dimensions from a science fiction standpoint, it's important to remember that, that the concept of higher level dimensions is an important part of theoretical physics as well. At least one plausible uh, theory in theoretical physics, string theory and super string theory, posit higher dimensions as a way of explaining certain three-dimensional phenomena. Um, and, and, and largely as a way of making the math come out correctly. So mm-hmm. whether those higher dimensions are actual or whether they they really exist or not is an interesting question or whether they're just a theoretical postulation, but if they actually exist, it's an interesting question. Well, where are they? Why can't we perceive them? And it, 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 it really does boil back down to why can't the two dimensional being perceive the three dimensional object? Why can't we three dimensional beings perceive these higher dimensions? They may very well be real. They may be necessary to make the math come out right. Theoretical physics is really, uh, all about this stuff especially super string theory whether that whether it's true or not you know we don't know that's why it's still theoretical physics but right. it's not purely science fiction higher dimensions are postulated in theoretical physics as well and that's that's those are your actual scientists studying you know actual theoretical physics it's not not something constricted purely to the realm of science fiction well, while we're talking about references to dimensions inside Star Trek, one of the things that came to mind is the reference in the original series episode, I Mud. And in that episode, if you recall, there are these androids with the, with some sort of advanced understanding of dimensions, and they supposedly have the ability to understand how these different dimensions can intersect with each other in some sort of parabolic way. I forget the exact language that's used, but in that episode, they postulate the intersection of different dimensions. Yeah, which I think was was ahead of its time, considering you know we're talking about the late nineteen sixties. Uh, you know, definitely was forward thinking. I think for its time, I don't think. Well, I think I think Bichet's video points to the fact that these weren't new concepts in the sixties, right? The idea right. of dimensions intersecting each other dates back definitely to the thirties and even farther back, like with Ed- Edwin Abbott's Flatland. So, but you certainly weren't w- seeing these things on television. Right. And I think that's where Star Trek added something new, you know, not only uh, creating a video. I think the, the video you, you referenced, Bichet, is brilliant. I love seeing it. it. Was It was like seeing Flatland come to life. It was it was really so well done. But, you know, what Star Trek did, I think, was take these concepts and bring them into popular culture, bring them into the, the perception of the general public. Um, you know, the fact that we can sit here and talk about dimensions on a Star Trek podcast, I think I think. Um, shows the the influence star trek has had in, in the the general understanding of these concepts yeah it's really interesting like it's it, it's abstract but it gets your mind flowing and your mind thinking and you know it's really it's really fascinating to try and come up with oh this was this and this was this and this alien could have been this and 
Yeah, it's it's really neat. It's it's a lot of fun to do. <laughs> yeah, and of course, this isn't restricted to Star Trek either, right? Any any sort of you know spooky paranormal, uh, you know, at the X Files you mentioned a couple weeks ago, Mike on on Metatrex, you, yeah. we had a discussion about X Files. Anything kind of popping in and out of in and out of existence, ghosts or spirits or you know aliens popping in and out of existence. You know, dimensions are a way of explaining all those phenomena, not just in the science fiction context, but fantasy and horror and um, you know. Uh, you know, spooky metaphysics stuff, not just not just uh, science fiction. So, you know, in the twentieth century, when 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 the perception of um, when the understanding of dimensions came to be uh, sort of generally understood, you know, paranormal re- researchers were saying, "Well, wait, well, ghost stories. If ghosts pop in and out of existence, or spirits, or can we use dimensions to explain all of those paranormal phenomena as well?" The the challenge, I think, is distinguishing spooky, you know, paranormal metaphysics from genuine science and genuine science fiction. Right? There's a, there's a distinction there in our approach to research, and there's a distinction in our popular culture and our in our fiction as well. Well, but in the video, oh, sorry for one second here. In the video that we watched, when they were trying to explain and they tried to show it, I mean, they could only do so much in a video from the 30s. But when they were showing like a cue like being popping in, right, it almost looked, it, it, it's the same special effect that they would use if a ghost was coming in to haunt somebody, right? And so every time I see this video, I'm like, well, maybe that explains ghosts. So people think that they see a ghost and they think it's a dead loved one or, or a haunted past or something like that. But it could be, you know, even in our own reality, a, slice, a fourth dimensional d- being does intera- A slice or a shadow of a, you know, we, we've referred, with yeah, us, yeah. Yeah, we've referred to slices and shadows. Does the fact that you can explain ghost stories with dimensions undermine the credibility of higher dimensions as an idea? I don't think so. I think it, I think it uh, enhances it. Because I, I can imagine someone saying, look, obviously ghosts don't exist. You know, the people who think they've seen ghosts are uh, confused in some way about what they perceived. So if we can explain that away with higher dimensions, that doesn't seem to add any credibility to the higher, the existence of higher dimensions. For, you know, for, yes, it has explanatory power, but if, if the, if the, if it's generally assumed that those kind of phenomena aren't real, then that doesn't seem to add any credence. But people to have always assumed that phenomena aren't real, that they can't explain, right? Like going back, back to, you know, beginnings of, uh, trying to explain the solar system and explain that the world is actually round you know people if they didn't believe it and they couldn't understand it they would just dismiss it you know beyond the pillars of hercules you know you you go beyond that and you just you know drop off the the end of the world and i mean we we have our perceptions and until until science is able to catch up and explain you know, I I don't think that these these theories are are outside of well, the realm of of I, possibility. I guess my point was just that. Look, yes, the idea of dimensions have great explanatory power. They can explain warp drives in Star Trek. They can explain Q like beings in Star Trek. They could explain uh, ghosts and paranormal experiences. They can explain a host of different things, right? So, how do you, given that, how do you distinguish which of those things are genuine? You know, genuine science, genuine parts of our reality, and which of those things are illusions or hallucinations or not genuine features of our reality? I, the, you know, the idea of dimensions almost has almost too much explanatory power in that sense. It's all real. It's all legit. I want to believe. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I want to believe. Well, Zachary, piggybacking on our <laughs> piggybacking on our discussion from last week, I, I think it's a matter of science catching up and either uh, confirming or refuting the speculation, the theory, if you will. Uh, you know, certainly these things exist, for instance, in theory. Warp drive exists in theory. Now, whether or not it's actually possible, we don't know yet. Yeah, I guess that's the interesting question. How do you go from a theoretical postulation like a higher dimension into experimental physics where we can actually experimentally verify the existence of these abstract concepts? Or will they forever remain mathematical abstractions that are fun and inter- interesting to talk about on a podcast, but we we fundamentally don't have access to? So just like a two-dimensional being fundamentally has no access to three-dimensional perception, as we saw in TNG, 
analogy, the loss, if a three dimensional being fundamentally has an, an inability to perceive higher dimensions, that's part of our perceptual limit. Will those higher level, um, uh, dimensions be fundamentally outside of our, our realm of experience? Will they forever remain theoretical? Just like the Enterprise and all of its three-dimensional glory would remain a theoretical construct at best to the two-dimensional beings that we see in that episode. So the first thing I want to say on that, I just want to add something to that Mike just said. He's like, you know, warp drive works in theory, right? You name a couple other examples of things that work in theory. Communism works in theory. That's supposed to be funny. Another joke that kind of fell flat. <laughs> so, but <laughs> fell flat. <laughs> fell flat. It fell flat. Two dimensional joke. That was funny. Um, <laughs> the um, wh- I just had a thought though. I'm sorry to just pull this out of the out of nowhere here. But what if this is how transporters work? You know, they always talk about how the the, the big theory is that you maybe you die and get reconverted somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But what if a transporter is actually pulling you out of dimension? And beaming you somewhere else. So you actually retain your cohesion, molecular cohesion, right? You're, you're not t- taken apart. You're not transferred to energy. You're actually pulled out of your three-dimensional location in space-time, moved into a higher dimension in some way, and replunked down in three-dimensional space in a different location. But you remain your coherent three-dimensional self the whole time. Yeah, that's certainly yeah. not the way that it's presented in-universe, but Bichet, that's... I mean, that's a fascinating thought. If, if I were going to invent a transporter, that's how I would do it. Let's do it. Copyright Fruling Matella Morrison 2017. <laughs> well, that, that would escape the issue of... of Circle with the R, boys and girls. <laughs> I, I think that would resolve the other interesting philosophical discussions you get with transporters, right? It would resolve the personal identity issue, right? Sure. If you're taken apart and put back together, there's a serious personal identity issue there, issue about death and resurrection and all of these other related issues. And, and if and if that's not the case, if you're not literally taken apart and put back together, it would it would eliminate that entire class of interesting philosophical discussions about transporters, you know, much to the disdain of intro to philosophy classes everywhere, but to our gain because we solved the problem. <laughs> Right here on Metatrax. <laughs> well, Bichet, this is your topic. Do you have uh, anything to add to the discussion? Any any other thoughts before we uh, wrap things up today? My brain is mush. I, I love this idea that we could actually put intro to philosophy classes out of business here with Metatrax because we're so much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> For for all of you philosophy professors that are using Metatrex in your classes, you didn't hear any of that. It's 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 like when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, right? I'm I'm the philosopher coming back, bringing my game to the philosophy discussions, putting those intro to philosophy classes out of business. Going to completely change the paradigm. Hey, and I just got to say, it was the episode that I was on where you guys decided this, right? So. <laughs> Don't worry, your royalty check's in the mail. <laughs> yes. Cut the check. 50% of nothing. Cut the check. Twice nothing is still nothing. E- even in a higher dimension, nothing is still nothing. It's like zero, zero squared is nothing. Zero cubed is nothing. Zero to the fourth dimension is still nothing. So you're out of luck, man. <laughs> it's like my bank account. We, actually, while we're talking about the mathematics of higher dimensions, this is actually a fun mental exercise. So if you have a square with this, a side of two, say two inches or two feet or something, if you square that, right, a square, a two-dimensional square would have uh, an, an area of four, four square feet, right? Sure. In three dimensions, if you have a, a cube, two by two by two, that's eight cubic feet. So if you extend that to a higher dimension, two to the fourth power, two times two times two times two. That's what? 16. 16. It's not cubic feet. It's quadrubic feet. Is that right? I don't know what to, what to call it, but that that would be the volume of a four-dimensional cube. You can calculate these things mathematically very easily, but th- that doesn't mean it doesn't help us in visualizing them, but we can describe we can describe their mathematics very easily. Well, the Borg, Hugh would have been able to do it with that eyepiece, right? You know, the, he just has to look at it yes. and he can invert the it. Seven and... of nine can do this with her eyes closed. This isn't even interesting. <laughs> yeah, she, she could do this while she's regenerating. <laughs> so again, that's not helpful in visualizing it, but if we were to describe a four-dimensional object mathematically, you can do that remarkably easily. But it might be in the realm of platonic, solids and platonic ideas you know that doesn't make it any more real just because we can describe it mathematically yeah 
So, Biche, anything else on Dimension before we wrap up today? No, I think that's about it. I think we got a wonderful discussion out of this, and I thank you very much for bringing me on the show to uh, to talk about this. I thought it was a cool idea, and uh, I'm glad you guys decided to run with it. I hope it met all of your expectations. This was your idea. You wanted to talk about Dimensions. Did we exceed yeah. your expectations here on Metatrex today? I hope so. I, I came in expecting two-dimensional conversation, and this is like fifth-dimensional conversation. It's great. <laughs> We're taking it to the fifth, fifth dimension. dimension. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bichet, before we shove you back into your own dimension, do you want to let everyone know where they can find you on the Trek FM network and around the internet? Well, you can find me here on Trek FM with new episodes of Melodic Treks, which is all about the music of Star Trek, as well as I guess I'm co-hosting Warp 5 now, which is our Star Trek Enterprise podcast. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've had some cool interview options, uh, opportunities come up recently. We had a Manny Cotto interview for episode 100. That was awesome. And we got to interview, you know, thank you, uh, and we got to interview Eric Pierpoint, who was, uh, mm-hmm. who was one of the Section 31 agents, and he's been on all of the, all of the Star Trek series. Uh, so we've had a couple of really good interviews there. Um, you can find me on Twitter, at Brandon Metella, and you can find me in the Babel Conference every once in a while. I'm taking a little bit of a social media break right now. I'm not on it very much anymore. I have to be on Facebook for for Trek FM, but I'm really not on that much anymore. But you know, you can you can find me you can find me around the network. I'll eventually get back to you if I don't get back to you right away. Uh, send me a message, follow me, I'll follow you back. Um, you can find me uh, editing the Patron Zone roundtables and publishing those and putting up your bonus content on Patron Zone. Social media can suck you right into another dimension if you let it. Oh yeah, it's a it's a the timeless dimension. Leave you feeling kind of flat. Yeah. Where did the sure. time go? <laughs> well, Zachary, the transporter chief tells me that he has finally got all the calculations in to get Bichet back to his own dimension. So, Bichet, it's been great having you. We'll do this again sometime real soon, okay? Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. All right, Chief. Energize. Well, Mike, that was so much fun to have Bichet on to talk about Dimensions, and it was great to get an overview of Patreon and the Patron Zone at the same time. Yeah, for sure. I always enjoy talking with Bichet. I've, as we mentioned before, we first met through uh, the Patre- uh, Patreon Roundtable and then having the opportunity to podcast with him over on Warp 5. It's always fun to, to chat with him. And this was a really interesting topic that he brought up for us to to tackle and i think we had a we had a fun fruitful uh conversation about uh dimensions uh, particularly inside the uh, star trek universe and definitely a lot more examples than i initially thought that we'd be able to draw out Uh, as i said during the podcast it's just not something that star trek has dealt with in real obvious ways and so you know, it, it was uh, it was pretty thought provoking, but I enjoyed the conversation. Again, it was it was fruitful. Yeah, this was a fun topic for me. It's something I've been interested in for a long time. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I read Edwin Abbott's Flatland when I was a kid. And it's a short little read. If you're interested in Dimensions at all and you haven't read Flatland, pick up a copy. You can find it for free everywhere on the internet. It's yeah. a fascinating read on Dimensions. And it appeals to my mathematically minded brain. You know, I like the fact that we can calculate things in higher dimensions, the things we can't visualize. It's a fun intellectual exercise to try to visualize things by analogy, by analogies with lower dimensions. And you you can use the concept of dimensions to explain lots of things inside the Star Trek universe. You can use them to explain warp drive. You can use them to explain uh, the Q continuum. You can use them to explain that interesting creature inside the episode Darmok. Mm-hmm. So it's a really fruitful discussion. We can explain certain phenomena that don't get a lot of explanation inside the Star Trek universe. And we can use the visual illustrations that we get inside the Star Trek universe to help s- shed some light on our theoretical, philosophical understanding of these very abstract mat- mathematical concepts like higher dimensions. So this was a really fruitful discussion. I hope ev- all you listeners found it interesting. I think Bichet got a lot out of it. I think we got a lot out of the discussion. It was We found more examples than I thought we were going to be able to find when, when, we, when I started thinking about dimensions. Overall, just a, a great topic here for Metatrex. I was just going to say, and, and I, will just, uh, I will just add a, an additional recommendation on Flatlands. I know you suggested it to me when we were first talking about uh, this podcast a couple of weeks ago, and I had an opportunity. It's not a, not a very long read. It's not a heavy read. Uh, it's fascinating if you, especially especially if you enjoy, as you mentioned, mathematics. Uh, it's it's certainly um, 
uh, something that uh, if you have a mathematics background, you would find very satisfying. As you mentioned earlier, the social commentary, 19th century social commentary, it's it's laden with with 19th century social commentary, but but really fascinating. It's an it's an excellent read. I I, I just would uh, add my recommendation to yours and say you know uh, as part of part of this podcast, I just it's free out there on the internet. Just uh, do a search for Flatlands, and you'll find uh, free copies of it. You certainly sit down and read it. In in addition to uh, as extra reading for this podcast. Yeah, I don't give a lot of book recommendations here on Metatrax, although I could. But definitely, if I'm going to give a book recommendation, Flatland is on the must read list for me. And it's interesting to me that it actually di- kind of disappeared from the from the literary vocabulary for a while, but kind of r- was rediscovered when Einstein started postulating higher dimensions when he was w- was uh, conceiving of of general and special relativity. And uh, Flatland was kind of rediscovered, and it's part of the part of the vernacular now. So if you haven't read Flatland, definitely go out and find it. It's by Edwin K. Abbott, but Two-dimensional beings aren't the only thing we've been talking about here on Trek FM this past week, so here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.fm. To the journey! The origin of the Voth was that the lizard babies went back in time. And then they evolved into yes. the Voth. Yes! yes. So Cap- Captain Janeway is the ancestor of their entire yes. race? Is that what you're Tom saying? Captain and Janeway are the ancestors of the entire Voth race. Literary treks. It never stops. You you never really have a moment to say like, yay, good job. It's like literally, okay, on to the next thing. You're probably already late on the next three things that you're supposed to be doing. Melodic treks. You know, when you're used to recording either at Abbey Road or Sony Studios in Hollywood, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to to go to another room that doesn't have that same kind of sound, you know. Um, and, And also the depth of players is not... Just, you know, just not as deep as it is here in, in London, for instance, you know. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out greatly, and it makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and of course you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link as well. Well, as we discussed earlier in the podcast with our Patreon manager, B. Shea, or Brandon Shea Mutala, another way you can help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week is to become a patron of the network through Patreon. If you visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm, you'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels, along with all the great perks we have for you. These perks include early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats in our content development team, and many more. We really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. And don't forget to check out Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society that will design and launch an 8-foot orbiter and return the craft to Earth. The NSS Enterprise Orbiter will carry more than 100 student-designed science experiments into space, and you can help make it happen. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. Well, if you'd like to contact us with feedback or suggestions for the show or to send us your thoughts on anything we discussed in this episode of Metatrex, you can contact us in several different ways. You can contact us via a form on Trek FM's website. Just go to trek.fm slash contact. If you'd like to leave us a voicemail, just look in the sidebar on the show page or go to speakpipe.com slash trekfm. On Twitter, you can find us under the handle at trekfm. You can always find us on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash trekfm. And while you're there, check out our listeners-only discussion group, The Babel Conference. Type The Babel Conference. That's B-A-B-E-L into the search field on Facebook or go to our website at trek.fm and click discussion on the menu bar. It is a closed group, but if you click join, one of our admins will let you right in. We also invite you to leave a rating and a review of Metatrex and iTunes. We'd love to hear your feedback and suggestions for the show, and we'd love to hear if there's any topics in Star Trek and philosophy that you'd like us to talk about here on Metatrex. Well, Mike, when you're not inverting yourself in a higher dimension, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? Well, Zachary, you can find me on Facebook. That's where I'm most active. I'm also around the Babel Conference from time to time. On Twitter, my Twitter handle is at cmichael1701. If you follow me, be sure and send me a note and let me know so I can 
follow you back on Instagram at cmichael1701. You can also catch me on recent episodes of The Ready Room and Warp 5. And Zachary, when you're not playing with your flip book in the Q Continuum, where can our listeners find you around the network and on the interwebs? Well, you can catch me hanging out in the fifth dimension on Trek FM's dedicated Voyager podcast to the journey, along with my co-host there, Kay Shaw, who's one of our associate producers here on Metatrex, and Suzanne Williamson. And if you want to find me on the internet, you can find me on Facebook and the Babel Conference, Trek FM's listeners-only discussion group, if you want to talk about Star Trek and philosophy with me there. And you can find me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the Metatrex team from the network. Specifically, we'd like to thank C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek.fm, and, by the way, the highest dimensional being I know of, our executive producers, Matthew Rushing and Kenneth Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, our production manager, and some guy named Brandon Shea Mutala, who moonlights as our Patreon manager when he's not co-hosting elsewhere on Trek FM. We'd also like to thank our associate producers, who we mentioned at the beginning of the show, Patrick Devlin. You can find Patrick under the Twitter handle at MagicDrop5. Kay Shaw, my co-host of To The Journey. You can find her at Chaco Weeble. Norman Lau, you can find Norm at Starfighter1701. And Kit Lofstadt, you can find her at Mother Cat. That's Mother with a Zero. Well, everyone, thanks for listening to Metatrex, a Star Trek philosophy podcast. Until next time, we will once again boldly go to new dimensions where no philosophers have gone before. Thank you.